so the entire goal of our project um it's it's not a very short not, not a short presentation so we have enough time and i'd like to walk you through the principles of this approach uh show you some of even even a simulation how how everything started and the entire approach was first developed for deep brain stimulation to provide a milder more effective version of deep brain stimulation and let then was adaptive and turned into um, a completely non-invasive treatment and I'd, I'd, I want to walk you through all these different things so that you can understand what all this about the very goal is to stimulate in a way as mild but nevertheless as efficient as possible in order to change the connectivity of the brain so that the brain does no long, is no longer able to produce or hardly able to produce abnormal activity. Um, Parkinson's disease is characterized by abnormal neuronal synchrony. You might think that synchrony is, is, is a nice thing. It's like harmony. Everybody is in harmony. But the problem is, it's like in a company. Imagine a company where every, all employees are doing this, the exact same thing. This doesn't work. Different neurons are responsible for different information processing jobs. But if they are all um, working in, in synchrony, this, this causes massive functional impairments. And the other thing is that also connectivity, meaning the connections between neurons are strongly impaired in Parkinson's. This is known since, uh, since quite a while and there are more and more papers coming out, uh, thorough studies showing how, how important also the connectivity changes in Parkinson's are. Activity in the brain and the connectivity of neurons are closely linked. That's known and it started at Hab Habian's principle that are, those neurons fire together, sorry, wire together, that also fire together. And this is an important point. And we do not just want to suppress abnormal synchrony in the strongest possible way or something like that, but we want to really change the, co the connectivity. So it's um, the engine in some sense that produces the abnormal synchrony. I show you an example of a Parkinson patient treated with deep brain stimulation. So the electrode is in the um, left VIM, ventral nucleus of the thalamus. Here's the um, the cable, and here's the the um, IPG implantable pulse generator. This is now the situation three months after implantation, and he's one of the patients who really had a huge benefit. An important point comes now, the stimulator is turned off. And as you can see, the, there's no long lasting effects. Mm -hmm. the effects. The effects come back immediately. And that's, um, that's very important. That's a typical feature of standard high frequency stimulation. It's particularly pronounced in, um, in, in specific target areas like thalamus. And this, um, when when deep, deep brain stimulation came from France to Germany at that time, I was working in Germany. Um, I was intrigued by the effect size of of this treatment, but on the other hand, the way um, deep brain stimulation works is you have electrodes implanted and you permanently twenty four seven fire with a high frequency, meaning greater than one hundred hertz high frequency pulse rate. This, to me, uh, appeared to be sort of unnatural artificial since uh, neurons don't talk to, to this in a, this way to each other they fire spikes or single spikes or brief bursts or things like that and what are the um deep brain simulation was a huge milestone and a huge improvement just for the technicians i greatly uh, appreciate if if you could mute the other other participants there's lots of background noise thank you And many Parkinson's patients had a huge benefit from it. However, there are limitations. On the one hand, as I already said, there, there are no long lasting therapeutic effects. And the fact that you have to stimulate a certain area in the brain and the areas you, you want to stimulate, they are not homo homogeneous. They do not contain, for example, just one um, specific type of cells or just one type of specific type of fibers. They are mixed. 
the compound areas that contain different types of cells, different types of fibers. And when you stimulate, and for example, Jerry Vitek in this group, they've shown it in, in, in a very beautiful way. Um, when you stimulate, you do not only generate um, side effects simply because the electrode might not be perfectly placed and you stimulate surrounding areas, but also because there are structures within the target you would like to spare, but you cannot properly or adequately or sufficiently spare if you're stimulating all the time. And in the meantime, there's even the word or the term DBS induced movement disorders, depending on the specific target, you, induced, you may induce different side groups of side effects. And from a clinical um, effects uh, size perspective, there's one limitation and that is deep brain stimulation can result in speech deterioration and it does not reliably improve gait and other so-called actual symptoms, gait balance. DBS is not the greatest in, in helping with this. So there are limitations with deep brain stimulation. There was a huge improvement, a huge step forward, but there are limitations. And one of the goals at that time, um, of my goals was to come up with something that's more efficient and milder. In other words, the first step was to use the the, the first step was to use um, first step was to use um, uh, or to design stimulation techniques that that use just a little amount of carbon, but effectively counteract the abnormal activity. And the the very the very important point here is you can do all sorts of things to syn synchronize um, brain activity. You can suppress it. You can in inhibit it. You can induce artificial rhythms what we want to do and that that's the the fundamental goal is we want to specifically counteract abnormal synchrony by desynchronization so the neurons should go on and have to go on to be active because only active neurons are able to unlearn to change their fiber their connectivity patterns to unlearn their abnormal connectivity and this is very important this was um the major foundation of of the of this approach and then what's what's been shown and i'll show you an example for this in a minute and then i go to the experimental data uh, we studied this in great detail in 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 neural networks so computationally theoretically and what you see is that plastic neural networks, networks that, that may change the strength of their connections. They can be in totally different stable states. Mathematicians or physicists call this multi-stability. So they can be, in, in a, for example, in a strongly connected. So these are the neurons and these are the synaptic connections illustrated just for sake of illustration. They can be strongly connected and produce strongly synchronized firing, but they can also be the exact same neurons weakly connected everybody doing its information processing jobs so to speak and in a desynchronized way and this is this this is uh is a huge opens up a huge therapeutic chance namely to to move this network from its abnormal state strongly connected strongly synchronized state to a desynchronized state and this is the very goal too that we have these neurons and you might know this from physics or from chemistry, these potential landscapes, and this is just for the sake of illustration, the attractor space is a bit more complex, that you, that you move an attra uh, the system from a pathological attractor with this pathological behavior and pathological connectivity to a physiological, more physiological attractor with this down-regulated connectivity and down and down-regulated synchrony. And we developed a number of desynchronizing techniques at that time and coordinated reset. It's a technique that we are further and further developing. There are many tiny things or details to tweak and improve and optimize. Coordinated reset turned out to be very robust in particular for, for clinical applications. And uh, the principle is the following. So if you, these balls symbolize um, neurons. So it's a bunch of neurons and uh, let's first start with the, as I said, with the invasive situation or the invasive conditions of deep brain stimulation. For deep brain stimulation, what you do is you implant an electrode, you check which contacts are the, the, the most optimal ones, 
and then you stimulate as strongly as possible until and you increase the amplitude until you induce side effects and then you just go below the side effect level coordinated reset is very different you use a considerably weaker stimulation amplitude and you stimulate at different sites at different times so prior to the stimulation all of the neurons are in synchrony and since you're stimulating at different times at different sites they get out of phase these different clusters these different subpopulations get out of phase and in this way you disrupt synchrony you cause these cluster states these are the um, sequential sequentially delivered um, see the coordinated reset stimuli and then they typically run through a desynchronized state for a certain period of time and this is how such a pattern for deep brain station simulation pattern looks like so the cycle length here is approximately at that time um, it was um, chosen to be the dominant um, period of, of the abnormal rhythm measured by means of the local field potential and you see there's on the one hand there's a periodic backbone we have cycles and we have also some randomness these sequences change it's contact one two zero and here one zero two and so on we we do pop pause, uh, pauses in between pausing in general is very important for, uh, for improving the learning so three cycles on two cycles off here we this uh, the population the neuron population is in a cluster state and then we use the time until it takes until it slowly resynchronizes so that we in this during this period of time do not have to stimulate so in other words we spare um stimulation we, we prevent from um any unnecessary stimulation and we provide the tissue the new nervous tissue also with the ability to do normal physiological information processing as much as possible let me show you one simulation and then I'll start with the experimental and then clinical data. So what you see here is a simulation of a neuronal population. So the, the y-axis here is the um, percentage of neurons firing per time unit, 20, 40, 60%. And we start stimulation and this is standard deep brain stimulation and see how nicely it blocks the neurons and we stop it and they come back again. It's comparable to the, to the video. And here, this is CR or coordinated reset. The abbreviation is CR, coordinated reset stimulation, this spatially sequential type of stimulation that only aims to disrupt but not to block neuronal activity. And on purpose for the, for the sake of illustration, we've used a very weak amplitude, very low amplitude. And what it does is, what you see here is the amount of synchrony. So the, the amount to which uh, at which neurons fire in synchrony. And the minimum of the synchronization or measure is zero and one is maximum synchronization. So at the beginning, they are strongly synchronized. And then we turn on stimulation and then we induce an intermediate desynchronization or weak desynchronization, simply because the amplitudes of the pulses were chosen to be particularly weak. But nevertheless, you see how nicely it works. Of course, we do not in immediately induce the desynchronization, but this intermediate desynchronization is sufficient in order to induce this process. And that's the very core mechanism of this um, stimulation approach. So what you see here, the y-axis, is the mean synaptic rate, so the strength with which the synapses, the neurons are connected to each other. And you see that during stimulation, they continuously decrease. And that's the very point. So in other words, neurons get retrained. They unlearn abnormal uh, synaptic connectivity. And that's our goal. We want to really change the structure of the stimulated networks and also not only the directly stimulated networks, but also networks that are important, that are within the circuits. And as you will see later on, these effects propagate through circuits. And after stimulation, as soon, um, we can turn off, completely turn off stimulation um, as soon as the, the synaptic weights are completely or sufficiently down, down, reg, sorry, down regulated and the desynchronized uh, and the neuronal population has entered a more physiological firing mode without the abnormal synchrony. Now, this is how it looks like in MPTP monkeys. 
this is a um, typical 10 minutes. These are seconds of 16 fold velocity. These MPTP, uh, these monkeys were rendered from Perkinsonian by MPTP. MPTP is a neurotoxic substance that selectively destroys dopamine producing cells. I did it together with um, Vasilios Miles and Tomabo and Evon Bizarre, one of the leading groups at that time in the field. And um, after the MPTP treatment, monkeys are severely sick. They only have sunlight between five and 10% of dopamine producing cells left. So it corresponds to very, very, very late stage Parkinson's. You see a little head and the little, and the little head protects the electrode from being pulled out because we were, the monkeys, macaca, mulata are small animals. We couldn't implant any large human implantable pulse generators. And the other thing at that time, there was no such pulse generator available that was able to deliver coordinated reset stimulation. And the monkeys received um, coordinated reset stimulation. Then we monitored how long do the effects last. And then they, re they also received standard um, deep brain stimulation. And they and we also monitored the effects. And the target area was the one of the typical target areas, STN, subthalamic, so-called subthalamic nucleus. And the all the monkeys were in this measurement cage for 90 minutes a day. It had a light barrier system so that we can measure the movement production rate of the monkeys objectively, so that we had an objective measure for this. Um, and we're not only relying on subjective scoring. And um, the monkeys didn't get any medication, not nothing, no dopa. And we're typically in a in a very, uh, very strongly affected and very late stage. And this is the same monkey now after two hours of stimulation. So two hours of stimulation and then the monkey again was pit put into this measurement cage. And you see that the movement production is like in a normal monkey. So they behaved like in a normal monkey. And the important point was we did this um, five days in a row for two hours daily. So not much. In total, it was only 10 hours stimulation. And the, the therapeutic effect lasted for a month. And that was the goal in some sense. So that was very super encouraging simply because that was our goal to stimulate only occasionally or regularly for a little amount of time, but nevertheless induced sustained and long lasting relief because if we have these after effects, if we have these long lasting effects, we do not need to stimulate permanently and this automatically will lead to a reduction of the side effects. And by the way, this is also the reason why we can also do it non-invasively because we do not need to stimulate permanently. In the meantime, it was, it was reproduced by a number of, independently by a number of groups. And just briefly, for, um, this is the, um, these are the data, the, the mean, the average of all of all monkeys, and all these, and the, and the, the, uh, the this corresponds to an average over five days, and because we worked in five days block, five five days of stimulation in a row, two hours stimulation a day, or five days of observation. Here, this was the observation, the baseline state, an MPTP very kinetic, as you've seen, state, and these are the acute after effects two hours after stimulation and you see there's some improvement this is classical dbs it's not significant and simply not significant because the windows were 90 minutes and we've we've done also more, more fine-grained analysis and we've shown that it's it's very it's pretty much like in humans so the effects uh, vanish af um, after after cessation of uh, standard deep, re deep, deep brain stimulation within 30 minutes and then these are the first five days after this five day stimulation block, classical deep brain stimulation. And you see they're perfectly back to where they were before, they're perfectly back to baseline. And this is now CR stimulation with this low and appropriate intensity of these uh, stimulation pulses. They're just a third of the stimulation pulse, the amplitude of the stiffer used for standard deep brain stimulation. So it's, not, it's, it's really lit, just, just a tiny bit of, of electricity we use for coordinated reset compared to standard deep brain stimulation and you see this beautiful increase as in the video and you see the long lasting effects 
up to a month. And this was the first study to demonstrate it as a proof of concept without any um, optimization of the parameters. And as, as I said, in the meantime, then we also have shown comparable, um, or who have confirmed these results and also have shown even longer la last, lasting effects. We've done this also in patients. At that time, there was no implantable pulse generator available that was, a, that was able to deliver coordinated reset stimuli. And for this reason, uh, we performed what's called an ex, uh, simula simulation in externalized patients. Externalization is a standard procedure, and that means you implant the electrodes, but you do not yet implant the cable and the and the, uh, the implantable pulse generator. And we stimulated through a very secure, very safe, portable stimulator that we developed to, together with the contract developer. Um, at that time, and we followed up the patients for three days, and we simulated them two two times two hours per day. And the, the question at that time was, on which scale, a time scale do these effects um, evolve? It's called the wash washing characteristics. Do we need days, hours, weeks, months in order to 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 induce such changes, plastic changes? in the affected brain circuits or um and what we've seen is the following and it's let me illustrate this by means of another video so this is a 49 years old Parkin, parkinson patient she's a right-sided patient and she also suffered from a dystonia at that time for more than a year, she, she was as a right-handed person, no longer able to use her right hand. She's not able to stretch her fingers. And this is post-operatively on the fourth, fourth day after surgery. And you see the full-blown symptoms. So the tremor, but also dystonia. We recorded the muscular activity, brain activity, all sorts of activity in order to monitor what's going on. This is about 20 minutes after turning on stimulation. And you see that the symptoms are gone and remarkably also as the, the, uh, the, the, the dystonia, because dystonia typically for them takes a while to, to respond to deep brain stimulation. And um, remarkably, um, and, and this is the very effect, the very important message here. And this is now one hour after turning off stimulation. And you see that the effect persists. So from a clinical perspective, it's very different. The response characteristics is very, very different. And we recorded, um, we look, also looked at the abnormal brain activity in the depth in the midbrain in the STN. So we recorded from the exact same electrodes we, that we used for stimulation. And this is shown here. This is um, these are the data from this particular patient. So what you see here, the x-axis is the frequency axis, and the y-axis is the spectrum spectral energy. So this this plot tells you the spectral energy to which amount to different rhythms contribute to the signal. And this is before stimulation. So we have this pronounced tremor related a tre uh, tremor related five hertz about five hertz peak and the akinesia and rigidity related so-called beta band peak. And this is after in total four hours stimulation, two times two hours stimulation, and then turning the stimulation off for one hour. So one hour after the last stimulation session, and you see that these peaks are gone. And this is very, very different to what we know from standard deep brain stimulation, for example. Um, Andrea Kuhn and, and others have shown this in great detail. If you turn off clinically effective deep brain stimulation, this peak comes back within 12 seconds. And it makes a huge difference if you desynchronize and reshape the network, or if you just suppress a rhythm without um, relevant or significant change of the network structure. And just briefly, this, this is how it looked like. These were the first six patients. They were akinetic or equivalence type without any medication. So they were off the entire three days and tolerated it super well. They were doing really great as you see in a minute. 
And this is another example is from patients. So this is a depth recording from the SDN. And I should mention that we stimulated all these patients only unilaterally. And this was because of technical limitations. Sometimes it's really good that to be limited, <laughs> although we don't like it. And um, because we developed this, these beautiful nice and safe stimulators, but we weren't able, for whatever technical reasons, to, to, to synchronize two of the stimulators. And therefore, we could only stimulate unilaterally. And we've always stimulated the, basically the, the more affected side, I mean, the part in the brain that corresponds to the more affected side. And what we've observed is that we have full-blown bilateral effects. There was no, no difference of the effects on both sides. And we, to be honest, we've never tested this to begin with um, without this technical limitation. So there's another indication of um, the fact that desynchronizing effects propagate within the brain. And what you see here is um, the, the raw signal, the, the so-called local field potential, LFP, recorded from the depth in the brain. And already by visual in inspection, you see these waves. You don't need uh, super sophisticated data analysis to see these waves. You see that's, uh, and this is not a normal um, signature of STN activity. And this was the morning of the first day of the three days during which the patients were stimulated, recorded and stimulated. And this is the evening of the third day, um, two, three hours after the last stimulation session. And you see that uh, the, the pattern is normalized. Another example of, uh, of the spectral power. So again, these are the frequencies in the x-axis and the y-axis, the spectral power. And you see this pronounced peak at the beginning uh, before and then one hour after CR stimulation. And you see how strongly the, the abnormal peaks here also in the beta band, beta band, how strongly they decrease. And we've, um, we've done recordings in the morning and in the afternoon prior. And so this was in the morning, in the afternoon, in between there were the two stimulation sessions. The patients were off medication during the entire three days. And you see how nicely and in an accumulative way, um, the, the abnormal Parkinson's related beta power uh, decreased. And so did also the motor scores. And they were also highly correlated. Those patients with the strongest decrease in the power had the strongest improvement in motor scores. So we you already, and, and, and the score improvement was quite substantial and super encouraging already. In three days, a substantial decrease on average. This is beautiful. And now, um, as you can imagine, I needn't tell you that, um, of course, it would be lovely to have something like this, an effective treatment like this without the need for, for any surgeries. In other words, a non-invasive stimulation, that's our goal. And the computational, all this is very much computationally driven math. We use lots of mathematics and, and physics for this. We do simulation studies. I showed you one simulation before. And the computational prediction was we, could, we should be able to do this non-invasively too. And the, the and that and this is because um, inducing a so-called phase a phase reset is means you stimulate a rhythmically active neuron and you restart its rhythm. You do not stop it. You do not block it. You do not induce whatever weird firing patterns or so. But the only thing, think of for like example somebody, somebody walking along um, a hallway, and then you provide the, uh, the, the person, the subject with a certain signal, and then the, the subject starts with a, um, with a new phase, so to speak, um, stride phase. And in the 1980s, there were a couple of um, fundamental studies showing that the phase reset of a rhythmically active neuron, maybe firing might be bursting mode neuron, is a very, very robust thing to achieve. You, no matter whether you stimulate the axon, so the cable, that the output cable of the neuron, or whether you stimulate the soma, the central part, also containing, containing some of the most important uh, um, yeah, processing parts of the neuron, and, and the dendrites, no matter where you stimulate, and no matter whether you stimulate electrically or thermally, 
with heat, for example, stimuli chemically or optically. This is a very fundamental response property. It's very well understood from a biophysics, biophysics standpoint. And this is what we use. This is our general or fundamental core mechanism. So we just want to control the timing pattern of the discharges of the neurons. We do not want to block them. We do not want to inhibit them or something like that. These are not massive changes. These are subtle changes, but the results, we aim at um, resulting massive changes. So the, the, the intervention is weak, but the goal of it is to have massive consequences of a weak intervention. Now, there's a beautiful, um, series of papers by Lenses Group and Lenses US, uh, US based neurosurgeon, based US based neurosurgeon. And they've, they've done um, a, a series of studies in Parkinson patients, patients with essential tremor, with dystonia, chronic stroke. And what they've, what they've done is they've characterized different um, brain areas in the depth of the brain. So the patients during electrode implantation, um, they recorded from specific brain areas, for example, from the so-called thalamic somatic sensory nucleus, the, the ventral caudal, there are different nomenclatures, ventral caudal, the, the so-called VC nucleus, which is the main hub, input hub for proprioception. So whenever you touch something, touch an object, or whenever somebody moves, you or you, you yourself move a certain limb, then the information about the touch or the, the, the information about the moving limb goes into this specific area. And what they, what they did was they vibrated in different parts of the body, for example, the face and all sorts of places. And what they were observed in a very reliable and reproducible way is that these neurons respond by means of a phase locking by means of a, um, in other words their firing pattern is determined by the vibration so when so let's assume this is for example the sine wave the vibration pattern then a single neuron fires for example when the sine wave is as, as it's at its maximum and not at, at its minimum. And this is shown here. This is the so-called cycle histogram. So what the x-axis is one cycle of the vibration. And, um, and the y-axis shows you the histogram. So in other words, how often does this particular neuron fire whenever the phase of the cycle is zero, close to zero, in between, or someplace else? And let's assume there's no relationship between the vi per peripheral vibration and the firing of these very important neurons, what we'd expect is a noisy flat line. So no relationship at all. But what we see is this beautiful peak. In other words, there's tendency, a strong and pronounced tendency of this neuron to fire at this, at a specific phase. And this is what we use. Um, so in other words, our goal is to use vibration to determine the discharge times of specific subpopulations, very small neural subpopulations in the brain. And why do we do fingertip stimulation? And that's because different parts in the body have different vol um, cortical representations. So the, the volume, the brain volume that corresponds to a specific part might be smaller, for example, if you look at the leg, the entire leg here um, corresponds to just this little volume, whereas the hand, for example, corresponds to a way larger volume. And this is, uh, this is illustrated by means of this so-called homun homunculus. In other words, although the fingertips constitute only a, a, a very small portion of the entire surface of the skin, nevertheless, the, the brain area that we stimulate is, is uh, comparably large, disproportionately large. And we know from different types of studies, computational, preclinical, clinical, that the desynchronizing effects propagate from one hub to the other in the brain 
And therefore, the goal was to find a good entry point into the brain in an area that's heavily involved in Parkinson's activity. And the, this is the same holds, by the way, for the motor cortex, the same um, homunculus type of organization. So in other words, we wanted to go to the thalamus and to the sensor motor cortex in strategically favorable areas. We've developed together at that time with engineering acoustics um, a prototype and the prototype glove with four channels for, for, uh, for four fingers that the thumbs were spared. And we delivered the same stimulation pattern. So it's the exact same thing as basically the exact same thing as for the electrical deep brain stimulation. The only difference is that we've replaced electrical bursts by vibratory bursts. So this thing here, this, this bar corresponds to a 250 hertz vibratory burst. Now let me um, show you the, uh, the results of our pilot study. Um, unfortunately, we, we got hit um, by COVID and this is why at that time, we had to stop the in-person visits after um, the sixth patient. And all of the data, we plan to, to do 10 or um, with an amendment 20. But as I said, then, then COVID, COVID showed up. And all of the data I show you are clinical data, the standard motor scores assessed after proper medication withdrawal, the so-called off-medication motor scores. And the medication withdrawal means, depending on the half-life of the medication, we had a withdrawal between 12 and up to 48 hours. So the patients on this visit day, the first visit day, patients came in in the morning, had, a, had no medications for at least 12 hours. Um, some of them, as I said, up to 48 hours. And the patients then didn't get any dopamine or any medication, but received two times two hours the glove treatment. And then at 3.30 in the afternoon, we did again this MDS-UPTRS part three, this motor score exam. And what you see was a significant improvement of the condition of the patients, although they didn't receive any, any medication. And some of them are really scared first to go off medication and still, and then also, of course, um, not to take any medication, but they did really well. It was a significant improvement. And, and what you see here is these are the cumulative effects, the effects that build up over time. It's our main target because we want to, as I said, change the synaptic connectivities in a way that these affected neural networks are no longer able to produce this uh, massive abnormally Syn uh, abnormal um, and synchronized activity. So the patients came in at eight, again at eight o'clock in the morning after medication withdrawal, and then they went. They would um, they went home, stimulated every day two to four hours a day for three months, and then they came again in after medication withdrawal in the morning, and they had a significant improvement. It was significantly changed, although no medication really off medication. And these are the, now let's look at the individual patients. The important thing is we don't only want to have statistically significant effects, but they, they should also be clinically significant. And in order to um, determine whether an effect is clinically significant, there's the so-called MCID, minimally clinically identifiable difference. And the, the motor standard motor score, the part three, um, MDS UPTRS part three motor score uh, has an MCID, it is properly evaluated. And this, this means if the decrease of the score goes beyond this limit, the MCID, we reach a level of cl clinical significance where patients say, oh, well, I'm really feeling better. And you see, and the, um, the acute data, so the first, very first visit where the patients were stimulated for in, in total four hours, didn't get any medication. We measured in the morning and in the afternoon. All of the patients except for patient three had a clinically significant improvement. Patient three at least didn't get worse while not being on medication as all others. And the cumulative improvements of the three months improvement 
And that's very important. So it would already be nice to just slow down their progression um, in a way. But what, what we see after three months is that all patients being off medication have a clinically significant improvement. That's very encouraging. And we also looked at, of course, at the um, total medication and this um, to, to determine and take into account the different types of medication. There's this so-called levodopa equivalent daily dose, LEDD. And you see that's the baseline. It's at, this is after three months. And already, uh, and what it means, I mean, it's just, it's just well used, but what it behind these well is their subjects, they're, they're, they're human beings. They're, and the problem with the medication sometimes is that patients do suffer from relevant side effects. And we had several patients who were able to um, skip some of their meds, specific meds, and got rid of really relevant side effects. And then we, in this three month pilot study, we also looked at the amount of critical cortical synchronization by means of electroencephalography. So we determined them in all these brain areas, we determined the amount of synchrony. And um, since the number of patients was not huge, we focused um, on the sensory motor cortex. So the primary motor cortex is here, the primary sensory cortex is here. And and the data of all of these patients was projected. It's a standard procedure projected onto the Montreal um, um, reference brain, Neurological Institute reference brain, the MNI brain. And we checked, are there any changes in frequency bands? And if so, in which frequency band? And the only change and really highly significant change was in the so-called high beta band 20 from 21 to 30 it's a typical parkinson's related frequency band and as you can see here at the beginning there's lots of abnormal synchrony so it's color coded the more synchrony the um, is on the red side and no synchrony is on the blue side and this is after three months and again patients were off medication properly withdrawn and also no other medication that in whatever way influenced EEG activity. This was carefully done. So it was a pronounced reduction of abnormal Parkinson's related synchrony. And we did a case series in patients and that time, um, the longest time stimulation was something like one and a half years. In the meantime, we're following up patients for four and a half years and more. And what you see here is these three Again, the, all the clinical data here were taken after medication withdrawal, after proper medication withdrawal. So withdrawing the, the medication 12 to 48 hours prior to the, the exam, depending on the type of medication and the half-life of the medication. And this patient, for example, was able to stay off medication for three days, up to three days, and he came in um, and you know, three days in a row, two days in a row, two days in a row. And what you see, and here's the motor score. So the y-axis is the motor score. The x-axis is days of vibrotactile stimulation. So this is about nine months, and this is about six months. And what you typically observe in, in Parkinson patients is that their motor score, off medication motor score increases, slowly increases over time. Because, because of the degenerative process, because of the disease progression. What you see here is that you have this beautiful, and um, if you fit a line to it, a linear decrease of these motor scores. So also in this patient, for example, beautiful decrease over time. And this is one of the patients we're able to follow up in person despite COVID. In person, these are the Stick, uh, uh, it's a patient of the pilot study, first six months, two to four hours a day, one month pre planned pause of the glove. But in, in, in between, the patient was always stimulating and, of course, always getting medication. But for the visit days, there was this off medication, this medication withdrawal. And here was a one month pre planned glove pause, and then uh, afterwards, only a maintenance dose of the glove, only one to three times two hours per week. So just a little bit of the glove. And you see that how nicely and the patients further improved. And we were able to, unfortunately not quantitatively, but um, we were able to follow up three patients uh, who went through the entire six month 
high dose, one month pre plan pause, six month low dose, and then they had to return the glove. And all of them improved in this way. And they had an after effect so of between one and one and a half years. So one and a half, and between one and a, one and a half years, they were with strongly reduced MODO scores and strongly reduced medication. Now let me show you some videos for the sake of illustration so that um, because bars or numbers or, or figures, curves do not tell the whole story. So this is a patient, Parkinson patient diagnosed in 2007. He used a huge amount of medication, basically every half hour here to take um, meds. He was about 50% in an off time. In other words, he 50, about 50% 50 of the time, he had to lie in bed because he couldn't move. He used a cane at that time and he was supposed to use a wheelchair because he was falling more and more often. And this is the patient in his um, close to best medication on state. And the instruction was to just enter the room and Unfortunately, you are familiar with this. Um, so the patient, you, you see these little steps. The arms are not swinging. The, there's no facial expression. And then he came to us and this was August, 2018. And I told him to use as much meds as, as necessary in order to feel as well as possible. There was no instruction to use medication, but since he had, um, since he mainly used, um, since he mainly used acute, um, acute um, short acting medication, he, um, he sort of, sort of titrated the, um, the medication regime and from day one on he went down to six so six seven six between six and seven that was the the medication for the next year and then he in after one and a half years he further reduced medication and this is the patient now after two times two hours with a glove treatment and you see the nice long um, steps and the arms are swinging and their facial expressions and then the patient, after three days, he stayed in, close to Stanford and came in for three days and then he went home and was, was using the glove for two hours a day and was able to restart working. See the nice gate. And the, the the totally surprising, one totally surprising finding already in the, this, one of the very first patients was that, and, and that's what several, uh, all, our, all of our patients with pronounced um, olfactory impairment or pronounced problems with smell and taste reported to us that the, the smell and taste, sense of smell and taste came back. So he was cooking pre-Parkinson's. He, he loved to cook for the family on the weekends. And then um, he was no longer able to do that because without smell and taste, you can't probably cook. And then he was, a, he, after a relatively short period of time, was able to cook again. Another patient of ours, for example, reported that he was on a regular basis. We didn't examine this to be perfectly honest, simply because we didn't expect such an effect. And uh, so we didn't, we, did, we weren't prepared to, to systematically examine it, but of course um, we noted it, but, um, um, the light um, and one patient for example was uh, on a regular basis in his park parkinson's clinic was administered a pennsylvania smell test it's about um, 40 different odors and you have to identify these odors and do a multiple choice test and he was for a long period of time was only detect one of these odors and that was wood fire and after three months of glove treatment he was able to detect all of them 
question is how does this um, how is this possible? Are there central components? So um, might the desynchronization also uh, be um, be possible to to enable um, the or improve the, the 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 information processing? Or potentially might also a, um, a massive change of activity might it also have some impact on metabolic and degeneration related processes? These are massively interesting and super important questions and we are, we are in the process of preparing everything to address these questions but in any case it's very encouraging and then in november 2018 this patient he was never a runner before he was running his first new york marathon And then in um, October, uh, sorry, in, in October 2020, he was, he was running his first um, Floridian triathlon. In the meantime, I think he's, he always ran, also ran another uh, triathlon. And the important point is the, these are um, more than four years. And he's now, he's really doing well. So it's not just a, a short effect, and in um, and that's quite remarkable. So he did not deteriorate uh, by uh, not at all, and he used the glove after one and a half years. He used the glove only for about one, two, or three times for two hours a week, not much. This is another patient, um, early onset patient, diagnosed at the age of twenty-seven. This is the first. Um, visit day, so where, where he was off medication, this was prior to viral tactile treatment, and he did lots of sports in order to improve his condition, but he had increasingly, uh, doing this workout was increasingly difficult for him because of, in particular, the right, the issues with the right side, so the, the balance issues, as well as trauma, and as you see here, that's the pull test, you're probably familiar with this, of course, and you see that he has balance issues and then he received the glove treatment and this is after six weeks of vibrotactile cr stimulation and here's another patient and this is to illustrate that patients so far we've done a one-size-fits-all type of treatment so everybody received the same stimulation amplitudes. Sometimes in some patients, we reduced them a bit over time, but they were not personalized. We are currently developing a, um, a fantastic next generation device, which is really able to take into account all the physiology and enable us to also really leverage the, end, the, the entire potential of um, the math and physics behind it in, in a, in a significantly greater way because everybody is different and parkinson's is not just a motor disorder it comes also with a sensory impairment patients for example some patients are a certain percentage of patients do really realize uh, easily realize their, uh, their um, impairment of the sense of touch for example they can't um, you know, detect what kind of coins they have in their pockets or things like that and in our patients, for example, after three months of uh, the patients who had pronounced a sensory impairment, they told us, for example, that they are, after three months of glove tr treatment, they are able to detect what kind of coins they have in their pocket again. And the, also the, the interaction between motor system and sensory system is impaired in Parkinson's. And, um, and already in the, in the periphery, the skin, we are stimulating the skin and the skin width varies strongly it depends on age gender depends on whether or not you're a smoker and all sorts of things how you use your hands and so on and all this will be accounted for now in a beautiful new version next generation version of the design i know the possibility to work with really world-class engineers i'm very happy about this i'm very grateful and but this is to show you um, that it takes time the next few um, videos 
to show you that it takes time until the effects ramp up. So this is a patient who, whose dominant symptom was fascination, the shuffling. That was a real burden for him. He, in this video, it's the first visit in the morning, he was off medication, but also on medication. It was really, really difficult for him to walk properly. So, and he's just instructed to leave the room and walk along the hallway and then turn around. And as you unfortunately know, it's very difficult um, for some or for many Parkinson patients to change direction, change velocity in, in particular, and we provoke it by asking patients to turn around in small hallways, as you see here now. And sometimes it was very difficult for the patient to get in back into a smooth mode of walking. And as you can see here, it's a more an abrupt type of jogging like motion. And then he came to us and this was the th three months visit again off medication. That's the reason, and that's why I show this this video. It's it's important to to examine patients off medication because he told us he was very happy because the the, the shuffling was basically completely gone when he was taking his meds in the normal way. He also had to he also reduced had reduced the meds already to some extent, and he was happy. That's nice. But you will really want to understand what's what's the patient's condition without medication. And you see in this video, so this was in the morning after the patient, after his medication withdrawal, and the patient was walking. And you see he already improved, but still the right arm is not properly swinging. And then when he was asked to turn around, he still shuffles way less than before. Of course, significant progress, but he's not yet. He was not yet there, so to speak. As you, you again can see that the right hand, the right arm is not properly swinging. And this is what I, what he sent me after five months. He he became friends with he made, um, with, with the other patient you've seen before. And this is after six months glove treatment and the one month pre-planned pause. So six months, two to four hours a day, one month pre-planned pause. And this is And as I said, we are currently uh, finalizing the development of a next generation glove system where we can really leverage all the, the different aspects and the potential of coordinated reset stimulation. We'll start new, a series of, of new trials in, in uh, summer, autumn, 